O kia ora, nam hi nui ke koutou katoa, nau mai haere mai ki tēnei hui papaho. Uh, greetings everybody, welcome to uh, the media conference. As you can see today, I'm joined by Dr Carolyn McElnay, uh, the Director of Public Health. I'm going to hand over to her to update you on case numbers and testing numbers before I run through a couple of items of government news and take your questions. Dr McElnay. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Today, New Zealand's total number of COVID-19 cases has increased by eight, made up of two new confirmed cases and six new probable cases. And all of them are linked to either confirmed cases or known outbreaks. The new combined total of confirmed and probable cases in New Zealand is 1,409. Sadly, there are two further deaths to report today. One death occurred in Waikato Hospital. That person was a man in his 90s who died yesterday. He had been living at home with family and was admitted to hospital on Saturday night very unwell. The man had a connection to the Matamata cluster. While the man's family were not with him when he passed away, staff at Waikato Hospital provided support to the man and his family to care for him in his final days. And sadly, the second death is in a woman in her 80s who died at Burwood Hospital yesterday. She was part of the group of 20 Rosewood residents who were transferred to Burwood on April the 6th. The woman had an underlying health condition. Her family were also not able to be with her, but a staff member at Burwood Hospital was with the woman when she passed away. Sadly, there's now been seven deaths from the group of Rosewood residents who were moved to Burwood. There are five other cases who remain stable at present, but this is a group of frail elderly people. This brings the total number of confirmed COVID-19 deaths in New Zealand to 11. These people and their families will be in the thoughts and prayers of all New Zealanders today as we are again reminded of the serious threat that COVID-19 poses, particularly for elderly and vulnerable people. We all need to continue to play our part to contribute to the elimination of this virus from New Zealand by staying home, staying in your bubble, breaking the chain of transmission and saving lives. There are now 816 reported cases of COVID-19 who have recovered an increase of 46 on yesterday. Today we have 14 people in hospital with COVID-19. The total includes three people in ICU, one each in Middlemore, Dunedin and North Shore hospitals. So that's no change from yesterday. Two of the ICU patients are in a critical condition and again that's unchanged from yesterday. There are still 16 significant clusters, no change from yesterday. And 15 more cases have been connected to the clusters, but I have to um, uh, reiterate that that's because a connection has been made. That's not necessarily new cases. As we go through the process of case investigation, we're able to make the connection to the clusters. And just an update on testing. 4,241 tests were processed yesterday with a rolling seven-day average of 2,674 giving us a total tests to date of 74,401. New Zealand continues to increase the amount of testing and is expanding the pool of those being tested for COVID-19 to include anyone with respiratory symptoms. We encourage anyone who has COVID-19 symptoms to get tested and we continue to encourage DHBs to make sure that they're supporting that testing. The level of community transmission in New Zealand is currently low and most of the cases that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 do have links to overseas travel or close contacts of other cases. DHBs, including in Queenstown, Waikato and Canterbury, are arranging for teams to go out into the communities, um, including through mobile testing clinics. They are also undertaking targeted testing to provide some further information about community transmission in these regions. Yesterday at Pack and Save in Queenstown, 343 
supermarket workers and customers were tested. About half of those tests have already been processed and all are negative to date. Today, a similar approach is being taken in Canterbury with another 250 people being tested at a supermarket. And in Waikato, there is also asymptomatic testing occurring at supermarkets in five towns, Otrahanga, Hamilton, Matamata, Cambridge, and Te Awamutu. This additional testing and targeted testing will add to the total pool of tests done and provide us with increased confidence in our data. And that will help give us a, an overall picture of COVID-19 in New Zealand. And lastly, I just want to draw your attention to the Health Research Council, who've today announced funding for researchers from the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand to co-lead three internationally significant trials in the fight against COVID-19. The trials will assess potential therapeutic agents to fight COVID-19, including hydroxychloroquine, which is one of a number of drugs which have got attention across the world as potentially a treatment for the virus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McElnay. I just want to add the government's sympathies regarding the sad news of these further deaths. The fact that we knew we would lose some New Zealanders to COVID-19 doesn't lessen the shock or the sadness each time it happens, and we send our thoughts to the family and friends of those who have passed. This also serves as a sombre reminder that we need to continue to stay home, to save lives, and to break the chain of transmission. Despite the release yesterday of information about Alert Level 3, it is important to remember that New Zealand is still currently at Alert Level 4, and we must make sure that we are following the rules and guidance for Level 4. Information about what may come next is not an invitation to adopt those Level 3 measures yet. So please remember, stay local, don't visit others, and don't do anything that could put you in danger and needing rescue. Going hard and going early has put us in a good position. Things could have been very, very different, so let's not waste this chance. As you know, Cabinet will meet on Monday to discuss and decide whether to extend the Level 4 timeframe from midnight on Wednesday or whether the country or some of it will move to Level 3. I want to say two things about this. First, as the Prime Minister made very clear yesterday, Level 3 is not markedly different from Level 4. It does allow more businesses to open safely as we position the economy for recovery and keep New Zealanders in jobs, but it is not a return to pre-COVID days. We are some time away from that. As we work through our decision, I note the news overnight that the UK government extended its lockdown for a further three weeks. Other countries have made similar decisions, such as France, Australia, India and Japan. None of that is intended to signal Monday's decision. I share it with you simply as a reminder that this is a long game, a marathon, not a short sprint. My second point is that whether we remain at Level 4 or move to Level 3, government support for businesses and assistance for workers remains vital and will continue. It will cushion the economic hit and it will help keep New Zealanders in jobs and our businesses viable. On that point, may I also note that our response has differed to that of some overseas governments and that a large part of the money that we are investing is already out the door and in people's pockets and bank accounts. It's been paid for 12 weeks up front, so no matter where we are, that money is reaching people. As an aside, and to, to throw back to my earlier comments about the importance of staying home to save lives, I'd note that the Treasury scenarios released earlier this week also reflected that a little longer now spent at Level 4 or Level 3 is ultimately better for the economy than an early exit and a potential return to lockdown later on. So it's clear to me that from both a health and economic perspective, what we're doing is working, and I urge everyone to continue that work. There's more mahi to do. Lastly, before I take your questions, and as some of you may have already seen, the Treasury has done as it said it would and release its weekly economic update today and an accompanying dashboard of high-frequency economic indicators. These indicators cover the underlying state of sectors in the economy, like transportation and freight movement, consumer spending and trade. 
The dashboard also contains information on the wage subsidy scheme and the MSD job seeker support payments. The government is trying to play in a, a role here in making sure that data like this is available to support decision making and independent analysis. The Treasury is working to constantly update its weekly dashboard as more data sets become available both from government and private sector sources. To end, I think it's worth acknowledging again that the wage subsidy is doing its job to protect jobs and help businesses and workers stay connected through the lockdown. To date, the subsidy has paid out $9.9 billion since we announced it on March 17th and is protecting the jobs and incomes of 1.6 million workers. In comparison, there are roughly 23,000 new people on JobSeeker support over that time. That represents about 1.5% of the amount of workers being covered by the wage subsidy. This shows that our action to move early and get money out the door to support businesses and workers was the right one. Happy to take your questions. The fact, that we're, the fact that we're in single digits today in terms of new cases, that would seem to be a good sign towards us moving to alert level three next week, is that fair? Well, it's an encouraging sign for Alert Level 4 having um, doing its job, but I don't think we should get ahead of ourselves. We've still got uh, a few two or three more days' worth of data to go uh, before we reach uh, the point of making a decision. I want to remind you of the important things that we have to, to assure ourselves of to be able to move. One of those is that we genuinely are breaking the chain of community transmission in particular. And while we've been doing, and the Ministry of Health has been doing some excellent work on getting to the bottom of the cases that we weren't able to identify, that work goes on for some cases. We also, I'll just finish the answer, we also need to make sure that we are, are fully, um, have in place fully the measures around contact tracing, around making sure that we've got all the capacity that we need in our health system as well. So there is still more work for us to do to decide on that. Just on that though, just following up on that, with Treasury saying a little longer now spent at levels 4 and 3 uh, is better in the long run, are we seriously still considering staying in level 3? Is that still a serious consideration? Staying in level 3. Uh Oh, sorry. Look, we, all those options are on the table. Cabinet has not uh, made its decision. We still have more data to collect, and we still have to take what is a critical decision very, very seriously. As I outlined, a number of other countries have taken the decision to extend their lockdown periods. We'll make ours on the basis of the most up-to-date data that we can get. New Zealanders have made great progress under Level 4, and we should all be very proud of what we've done, but this is an extremely important decision and one we'll take with the most up-to-date data. So it's amazing that um, these frontline health workers are able to be with these people um, you know, when they're so unwell before they pass, but you talk about the fact that the families aren't there, that is devastating. Is that something that will change under Level 3? Well, as was discussed, I think, the last time um, you raised this question, that's something that's been considered, I know, mm -hmm. by the Ministry mm -hmm. of Health, and I'll, I'll get Dr McElnay to say anything more about that. It is a heartbreaking time for those people, and... I, like the Prime Minister, you know, can't imagine how that would feel for me. Um, these are the sacrifices New Zealanders are making so that we're making the progress we are. And so, you know, my sympathies go out to them. Um, but Dr McElnay, mm. do you have anything more on that? No, no, that's, that's totally right. And, and, and we want to have a very safe environment for our patients as well as our um, family and obviously our healthcare workers as well. So we will be looking, uh, particularly as our numbers have gone right down, at what we can put in place in order to enable that but still keep people safe. To expedite that work? Well, it's it's happening at the moment. Um, so we're we've expedited it. We're, we're looking at how we can do that. In the past, you and um, Dr. Blomfield have both talked about um, foreshadowing potential further deaths um, at Burwood. Is that still the case? As I said, we have got a number who are uh, confirmed or probable cases. This is a group who have been frail and vulnerable um, from the outset. And we, we just can't predict or we can't say um, in, this, in this age group and with these, um, the frailty that they have, you can get deterioration quite quickly. And so we're aware that that might, that might be the case. That, that doesn't mean that it will happen. And of course, we hope that it doesn't. But we're not out of the woods yet. Yep. Yep. Um, just a question around um, contact tracing. A couple of things. Dr. Uh, Burrell's contact tracing report when can we expect to see that in the public? And also, 
around these community tests being done in Queenstown and Canterbury? Are people compelled to do them? Are they happy to do them? What's the feedback there? Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr McElnay on some of the detail of that. On the first point, I'll have to find out for you, Colette. I don't have that information with me today. On the second point, my understanding is that they are asked if they mm -hmm. want to participate in that. Um, from what I saw in Queenstown, people have wanted to do it mm. and have actually made sure that they take the time um, to have the tests done on them. Uh, this kind of surveillance testing is useful. As you heard from Dr McElnay, half of those 350 odd tests in, uh, in Queenstown yesterday have already been processed. Everybody was negative, but this is the kind of reassurance I know that we want. Mm. We want to maximise the amount of testing we do. We have capacity for more testing in New Zealand, and so we'll look forward to the outcome of the of the two extra sites today. Anything yes. to add on that? Um, uh, just reiterate that yes, it is completely voluntary. I've, I've got um, some feedback on how it went yesterday in Queenstown, and that went very well. Um, there was a high demand. They actually um, took more swabs than they'd been anticipating taking. Um, it was a random sample of, of um, people who were shoppers at the supermarket, as well as workers at the supermarket and so um, the uh, rollout today in Waikato and Canterbury will be following the same sort of model but completely, completely voluntary. Sorry, I'm going to be tabling and come back to you. Dr McNeigh, can I ask, is there any more information regarding to the Invercargill home death and whether that has been linked to um, we're still investigating that. My understanding is it was a post-mortem um, has been undertaken for that individual and we're waiting for the results of that. So we'll be able to update you once we've got word back from I'll go down that the back and um, What do you think of the proposal um, that I understand is under consideration that five million COVID cards uh, should be distributed as a, um, to enable contact tracing that everyone would carry, I think, at a cost of $100 million? What's Look, there's a lot, a lot of work being done in a lot of different uh, businesses and uh, research centres on what is the best way to be able to support contact tracing. There's been a number of questions at previous com press conferences about Bluetooth-related um, testing and testing involving mobile phones. I'm aware that there is work going on in, in uh, a card-type approach. Um, we have to assess all of these as to whether or not they are the best way in order for us to get the maximum amount of contact tracing done and whether they can practically work and what are some of the other uh, consequences, for instance, around privacy. So certainly aware of that work, the Ministry of Health um, working very closely with a number of different people and we'll have more to say about that as we come to, to make a decision on how we use it. Just a couple of questions on the, the random testing. Um, why did you choose those locations and how much of a role will those results play in the decision making on Monday? Well, we, um, we've been uh, increasing our testing um, over the last few weeks, but we're mindful that that um, requires people to present for testing. And so we, we sought advice from our technical advisory group as to how we could increase our confidence that we really didn't have any undetected cases in the community. And they, they advised two things as a, as a, a short-term measure. They advised us to increase our testing at our CBACs and our designated practices and make sure there were no access issues. But the other uh, recommendation they made was to actually target what they referred to as um, hotspots. So places in the country where we know we have got cases, we've got higher numbers of cases in those areas. So. We identified uh, four places, Auckland, Waikato, Canterbury and Queenstown in particular in the southern district and we were able to stand up very quickly the testing in Queenstown, Canterbury and Waikato. And so it won't be perfect information but it gives us a snapshot of people in the community and the reason that we uh, chose supermarkets is because supermarket workers are in contact with a lot of people so they would be highly exposed if there was something circulating in the community. So um, we worked with the supermarkets to, to stand up that testing. And in terms of the second part of your question, Tova, it will be one factor, um, but it's within it's a factor within a factor, essentially, that, as I've said, one of the main things we're concerned about is are we breaking the chain of community transmission? Now, this is a, a helpful piece of information in that regard, but equally is the earlier contact tracing we've done and the work that I talked about uh, just before in terms of going through those cases where we weren't sure 
Minister and starting to eliminate some of those cases as being connected either to an overseas mm -hmm. visitor or an existing close contact. So all of that information comes together as part of our consideration. Yeah, just, uh, Sorry, Mikey. When can we expect the testing to be done in Auckland and is it still being done in South Auckland? So this was a, a snapshot test to do uh, yesterday and today so that we could get the test res results back to inform um, our advice about the level of disease across New Zealand. We will be doing further testing. We haven't yet worked out exactly where and what that looks like, but that is part of our surveillance plan going forward for COVID-19. We'll just come over to you. We'll just come over here. So yeah. mentioned testing would be undertaken in South Auckland. South Auckland would be one of the communities that we would want to get some testing done. We just haven't been able to organise that for today. Okay, just over here. On the contact tracing, are you, are you, is the government specifically looking at the COVID card model? And doesn't this need to be done a whole lot quicker if we're going to be, you know, leaving a lot, feasibly leaving a lot down soon? Oh, look, the work's been underway for some time on a number of different options. We're certainly aware of the COVID card option as one of those. The Ministry of Health has been working closely with a number of different uh, providers. It, like beyond being aware of it? It's one of the many options that have been put in front of the government and it's one that we're aware of and it's one that the Ministry of Health I know has had conversations mm. with some of the people who have been developing it. Mr. Yes. Mr. The continued ban on hunting at Alert Level 3, David Seymour says that's illogical because data shows it's actually safer than some things that are allowed like swimming and tramping. What's your response to that, and is hunting something that the government's willing to reconsider before we move? Well, there, there isn't a ban on hunting. What there is is a piece of work that's underway at the moment to assess whether or not it can safely go ahead at Level 3. I believe um, the website may have um, had a, an error on it yesterday that said that hunting was banned. That work is underway right now to consider whether or not it can take place at Level 3. I just reiterate the principles we're trying to apply here, which are about making sure that we keep people as safe as possible, that we are involved in low-risk activities, um, and clearly hunting, for fairly obvious reasons, has some high risks attached to it. But if it can be done safely, that's what we're now assessing, and that work will be finished um, as we come into early next week. Well, that's 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 May, actually, then. Melissa, can I just ask a question on schools? Um, a lot of principals and teachers are upset that they weren't consulted ahead of yesterday's announcement. What is your response to that? Well, I think it's really important to remember that at any point that we do make a transition down to Level 3, the Ministry of Education has been very clear that schools would not open for pupils for at least a week after that. So if you think about where we are now in the best possible scenario, we're still two weeks away, effectively, from schools reopening. So there is now time uh, to work through with teachers, principals, parents and students to make sure we can make this work. Uh, I understand there is discussions this afternoon between the Ministry of Education and uh, principals and teachers to make sure we work through how this will work. Uh, this is uh, a situation where I believe we can make make uh, schools into a place that will be very safe for students and teachers, that will be available for those people who have to go back to work for their children to attend. And so I'm confident we can do that. We've just got to use the time we've got over the next couple of weeks. Would you also see yourself going back on some of the ideas that you announced yesterday, for example, would you go back on the idea that it's voluntary or could you do staggered rollouts? I mean, could you change that system if those issues continue to arise in these discussions? Well, the point of consultation is to hear from those who are at the coalface or the chalk face um, and make sure that we, we structure this in such a way that it does work and it upholds the public health principles that we've got. I think it is really important, though. I believe that parents will ultimately make the right decision for their children. I trust them to do that. And so, you know, some parents will be in a position going back to work where they do need to make sure that their children go to school. Of course, if they can stay at home, and we want people to stay at home if they can, then they can be there with their children. So we've got time to work this through. One, one last clarification point on that, sorry, one last clarification point. So did you say that um, schools will definitely have at least a week for weed level four lifts, regardless if that's in one week, two weeks, or three that's weeks? That's correct. Always that's correct.
the um, the tracing apps. Where are you with those, and have you ruled out using the Singaporean one after talking to? Um, As I say, there there's there's ongoing work on that at the moment. The shortcomings around the, the Singapore app are ones that that are being looked at. Um, obviously, it's an example of that kind of technology, and there are other examples as well. Uh, so it's about finding what is best to work for New Zealand. Um, as I say, the Ministry of Health is closely involved in that work. Uh, you'll appreciate that this uh, development is happening in real time. This is not like a, a piece of technology that someone's been working on for two or three years. And so, therefore, we, you know, it's, it makes sense to talk to a number of different people, uh, but we're certainly aware of the progress that's been made. Do you, do you think it's safe for 20-plus young, uh, young children to be attending an early childhood centre? Well, we are working very closely with the Ministry of Education um, to um, to work through the specific advice in order to keep um, children safe and teachers safe and families safe. So um, we, I'm not aware that we've actually um, uh, released a specific number. We continue to work with them yeah. following uh, public health principles. Yeah, and that's the, the most important thing here is that the overriding uh, uh, decision here is around public health and upholding public health. Um, clearly, the early childhood sector is one where we do have to work closely with those who provide the education there to make sure it can be done in a safe way. Uh, the creation of bubbles within schools and within early childhood centres is our belief to be the best way of making sure that we maintain uh, those public health principles. It's the reason why, for example, in secondary schools that we're only taking people up to year 10 because that allows the schools to be able to you know, maintain physical distancing requirements, for instance, maintain uh, bubbles staying together rather than interacting with other bubbles. Clearly in an early childhood setting, there are um, you know, particular uh, things that need to be borne in mind in terms of the way that, that toddlers are, uh, will interact with one another. That's why the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education are working together to refine that advice. Are you, is the government working on a specific uh, hospitality support package, if yes, what? Yeah, look, we're working on further support for businesses uh, and one of the things we need to do is understand more about the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the way that uh, we respond to it on particular sectors. It's quite clear from the hospitality uh, and restaurant associations that they're pleased that some of their businesses are now going to be able to reopen under a level three framework. If you look towards a level two framework in the future, you can also see further opportunities there. So we'll take our time over the coming uh, weeks and months to look at how each individual sector is supported, but we have work underway around further support for both businesses and households and individuals. Really crying out. One of the things that they're really, really crying out for is rent relief. Will you at least consider that? I've, I've said before that we are considering that. Obviously, we made some interim steps earlier this week in that regard uh, in terms of the legislative changes. But we need to look overall at how we support businesses to get through this. Our focus has been on those that are vulnerable but viable, and we'll continue to look at that. So, Mr. Uh, wider Rafa appears to be. Um, have zero active cases right now, perhaps maybe the only region. Why is this, is there any particular reason behind the success there and could it be replicated elsewhere? Um, I don't think there's any particular success there. Um, they certainly um, did have um, cases. Um, I think that's just uh, um, that's just what happens. Um, cases can pop up anywhere. We've seen that um, particularly with our uh, large events and functions that you can have people from all over the country being there and they go back to their home place and then that can cause other cases. There's no there's no science behind one why one place would have further higher cases other than um, others. But what we what we now are seeing across the country is a high level of testing across the country, so that's giving us a much better assurance that we're not missing any undetected cases. I, I do think it's important to remember when data is reported DHB by DHB that it, it doesn't necessarily pick up the point mm. that Doc, Dr McElnay is making that, for example, the Hereford Ball Conference in Queenstown is actually the source of a number of the Waikato DHB cases. So it's actually a little bit difficult mm. to say it's about a particular yeah. region per se. Yeah. Yeah, so just on... Um, on health inequities, um, how confident are you that, that your public health response is, is capturing a concern around um, Māori and Pacifica communities? Well, we're very conscious of 
um, the need to uh, look at our um, health inequities. We do not want to worsen any of the health inequities that, that we have as a result of our COVID-19 response. So that's been uh, very much a part of the response that we've put into place and the advice that we've received as well. And we've also, it's important to remember that we also have made provision for specific funding packages for Māori health and Pacific health providers. That's a recognition of the fact that in those uh, population groups we know that we have to work extra hard to make sure we don't allow those inequities to increase. So in terms of the public health response though, is there anything specific that, that are being done for those communities? To well, I've actually just said that. We've just funded uh, those particular groups with additional money um, and there will be ongoing focus as part of a public health response on all groups across our community, but especially those who we consider may be more vulnerable. I'm just going back to Toby. Um, uh, Dr McElnay, CCDHB has said that the nurse who tested positive for COVID-19 was wearing full PPE and had gone through PPE training. Mm. What does that say about the effectiveness of PPE and what safety assurances can you give those healthcare workers? Mm. Well, we're still investigating that case to see exactly what, what has happened. That's my understanding is that um, she was wearing full PPE. Of course, um, uh, we haven't yet uh, uh, fully investigated the um, source of infection um, from this nurse and the Public Health Service is continuing to do that. Uh, PPE is is part of the overall protection that we can put in place for our healthcare workers and for patients. Um, but there are other factors that we also need to look at, which I don't have the information on this individual. Um, but certainly we, um, we certainly um, encourage and are supporting the use of PPE by our healthcare workers. Just go down, down the we'll Just go down the Just a follow-on, can I just a very quick follow? Sorry, do you have Sorry. an update on the number of healthcare workers um, who currently have COVID-19? So we have 128 healthcare workers who have been reported to date, and about half of those um, were infected outside the workplace. And we're c continuing to investigate the other half because it's actually really, it is really critical that we understand how they um, acquired their infection. Does this move around schools at level three? Is it for educational reasons, or is it effectively creating like a babysitting type? Service. We absolutely want um, students, children to be able to continue to learn. That is our primary focus. It's the reason why we've rolled out the online learning program and all of the support that goes with that. And we uh, are completely focused on this as an educational issue. But we have to undertake that education within a safe uh, public health environment. Hence, as I said before, why in the secondary school settings we're looking at making sure that it's only those um, up to year 10 so that we can space people out and have physical distancing. Similarly, that's the reason why we're looking at bubbles within primary schools and ECEs. This is about making sure that educational opportunity is available. I just want to reiterate what I said before. We know that a lot of parents will make the decision on behalf of their children that they'll stay home and continue to use the distance learning opportunities. That's something to be encouraged. But for other parents, they may not have that choice because they'll be going back to work. This is about making sure that their children continue to get education as well. Ben. Minister, just a couple of questions about the greatest game of rugby league. Um, what do you make of the NRL's plans to resume on May 28? Have they briefed you, given the Warriors be involved? Do, do you support it? And do they actually need a special exemption to leave New Zealand to play it? Um, personally, I haven't been involved in any discussions about that. I, I believe there may have been some high-level discussions uh, between um, some people working on behalf of the NRL and Sport New Zealand. Uh, look, that sounds like a very ambitious date to me to um, start a competition up, um, and no doubt uh, there's a lot to work through on both sides of the Tasman about how that would work. Um, clearly, both sides of the Tasman are operating strict quarantine arrangements at the moment, and therefore that provides some real limitations on um, the ability of people to, to travel and spend time um, in, in situ. I did hear yesterday uh, that the other NRL clubs had said that they wanted to make sure that the Warriors had the opportunity to undertake pre-season training once they got to Australia, if that's where they got to. So if you think about that in terms of the timeline, it's it's pretty ambitious. I think overall, you know, the, the principle we continue to have to apply is public health and safety, and that applies as much to people who are professional sports people as it does uh, to anybody else. Well, of um, course, if it's a sports question, thank I'll you very you. much. <laughs> what clarity will you be providing to national sports organisations around the sport? Which sports are able to resume training, and in what capacity? And if and when 
the nation moves to level three. So, so in level three, um, and actually some guidance about sport and recreation um, at the levels has just got, gone up on the COVID website in, in, in recent time. At level three, there really isn't the scope for that. Uh, at level three, we want people to stay in their bubbles still. And so I know a number of our professional athletes are, are training hard inside their own bubble. Uh, when it comes to level two, uh, there is further work to do there as to what might be possible in terms of, of particularly contact sport at a professional level. Uh, that requires conversations with, with health officials and with sports clubs. Clearly myself as a sports fan and many others around the country would love to see uh, that take place, but it certainly won't be happening at level three. Up the back, up the back. Yeah. Um, on the active cases, do you know how many of them are in quarantine or managed self-isolation? I don't have those figures uh, with me, but we can um, we can get that information. Yeah. Sure. Just back down to clear at the front. Um, under the level three rules, the relocation rules, would someone in a bubble be able to move to their holiday home if they were staying in the holiday home the entirety of whatever the next lockdown period is? Uh, I think, it, as I understand the bubble rules, we want people to essentially stay where they are. If they do need to relocate back to a region for work, then we have said that that is OK, but we do not want uh, a large number of people heading off to their holiday homes. Can I, still, um, can I just want to ask about bills in quarantine coming into the country. Can you give us a bit of an update around... Um, how many have come in, um, how many more you might expect, and what the government's doing for them, how that's panning out? I don't have particular numbers in front of me, Colette. Um, clearly, um, numbers have dropped off significantly, uh, and we can come back to you with what those are, but uh, it's to be expected that people have made their way back to New Zealand. There are uh, declining numbers, and there have been every week um, since we've been in, in lockdown. Uh, in terms of how it's going, uh, my understanding is it continues uh, to work relatively well. Um, people are being looked after, and uh, they are being assessed and, and, and monitored, as we said they would be. Yeah, so, Mikey? Yeah. Um, the economic dashboard talks about the IMF forecasting much worse um, global economy in 2020 than, than during the global financial crisis. But then it goes on to say that the global economy is forecast to rebound strongly in 2021. Are you confident it'll happen that quickly? Well, that's the forecast of the, of the IMF, and it's certainly what I think everybody would want. Uh, what that reflects is that um, economic activity will have some uh, boost um, when we do come out of periods of lockdown around the world. Uh, but clearly, all of these projections are being done in an environment where we lack any data to compare it to. We, in many ways, can't compare it particularly well to the financial crisis because that was a crisis of the financial sector and the system. This is essentially a health crisis that is leading to a, a demand crisis within the global economy. So they're actually different examples. Clearly, what we'd all like to see is the, is the economy rebound as soon as possible into 2021, but we'll need a lot more data before we can be sure about that. Craig? Might, might the government start pushing ahead with some of its infrastructure projects under Alert Level 3, or would they have to wait to Level 2? Oh, look, I mean, what Alert Level 3 allows is some, some productive parts of our economy to get going, including the construction sector, forestry, manufacturing, and so on. So within that sector are a number of uh, government infrastructure projects that I would like to see get going as soon as they can within the public health guidelines. Clearly, if, if we're able to move through the levels to level two, that'll see more of that work come forward. In terms of the uh, identification of projects, that work continues. Uh, there are a lot of projects that have been identified, and so um, we'll take some time over the next couple of weeks to, to work our way through that list. Jenna. Are you, are you alarmed at the number of complaints MBs received about employers pocketing the wage subsidy? Look, there are a large number of complaints and they need to be thoroughly investigated. Uh, we've been extremely clear that the purpose of the wage subsidy scheme is for money to reach employees and make sure that they stay attached to their business. So those are, are accusations now need to be investigated. They are being investigated and I'd be very, very disappointed if businesses have misused that scheme. Just to follow on that, um, Michael Hill Worker has told us that they haven't received the subsidy and they paid out two point two. I'll look into that right now. Just a couple of um, health, health queries, sorry. The, a Wellington, um, the Wellington nurse who's tested positive, we've been told that, uh, forgive me, I'm just trying to decipher this, that um, a, pa a, po a patient positive with the virus left an isolation room, which was how the nurse got in 
affected. Can you confirm that? I think that's probably the kind of investigation that Dr McElnay said is exactly underway, and rather than just take uh, from you something that you're deciphering, um, that's exactly why we need to look into that. That's another query from a newsroom. We've got another one. In Christchurch, we've spoken to a COVID case who was cleared from self-isolation after being symptom three for 48 hours, but then subsequently was retested as positive later that day. Is that 48-hour window um, suitable? Well, we on our website we have our guidance for when uh, patients are considered to be recovered. It's 48 hours from when they're symptom free. I don't know the details of that particular case, and there there may be more uh, in or, in order to in interpret your question. Um, but that guidance um, is there, and it talks also about a 10-day period from the onset of symptoms. So. Um, We've got quite a robust definition of recovery. We'll just take a couple Some more, more questions. Health questions. Sorry, can I get your reaction to the trialling of the hydroxychloroquine um, drug? Um, and why is that so important? And um, what benefit is New Zealand bringing to the table by investing in vaccines? Or, not, sorry, not vaccines, but into this research? Well, the details of that research, um, I'll have to pass you over to the Health Research Council because they've been involved with the, the funding of that. But I guess it's a reflection of the worldwide interest that there is, and in, in New Zealand is will be, the researchers that we have will be one of a team, part of a team looking into this. And there is interest, as you, you'll be aware, on the possibilities of this drug. Um, and so we do need to do further research in order to really understand whether or not that's the case. Could you just say the name of the drug again, May, for me? Hydroxychloroquine. Oh, well thank, done. thank you. That's, that's fantastic. We'll just take one more. Um, you said that you really want to ramp up testing, Dr McElnade. Why not then remove the requirement to have a referral from Healthline or a GP to get a test? Well, we will be looking at how we can best make our testing um, as available as possible going forward. It is one of our central pillars for maintaining uh, elimination, uh, which we hope to achieve, but maintaining that going forward. So we need to, as we move through into the next phases, we need to look at how best we can get that testing. And to be happening. clear, if, if people have respiratory symptoms, they should come forward and they should be tested. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.